when we seen Sean go to war with Jack Hermanson for five rounds standing up. And that wasn't too long ago. And then he got starched and absolutely obliterated by Alex Pereja. And Jared just had a bad fight with Izzy where he couldn't land anything. Because Izzy was just fighting that type of way. I don't think that there was anything Sean could have done that would have been much differently. But on the opposite end, I don't think Jared would have got knocked out in one minute. By yeah, Alex. by Alex. Yeah, he would last. Maybe in minute two or three. Yeah, he would have lasted not, 30 seconds longer. Yeah, he, he would have lasted a few minutes longer. Okay, let's get started with this main card here. We have in the middleweight division, Cody Brundage versus Mikal Olenzajic. We have Cody Brundage with a record of eight and two, currently on a two fight win streak coming off of a, an impressive submission win over Dacha Lujianbula and an impressive and unexpected win over Treshawn Gore. And he was expected to fight Rodolfo last month, but that fell through. So now he's fighting Mikal Olenzajic and McCall is currently 17 and 5 on a one fight win streak. You know, it's funny that Sam Alvey fight really don't age well at all, man. Yeah, like, he's doing nothing. It, it's good for your highlight reel. It's pretty brutal, but. And they kept you employed, but. Yeah, but. Okay, even when he lost to Dustin Jacoby, he had moments in the fight. It just, he won the first round, but in the second round, he got hurt and he never really recovered. And uh, I don't know if it was him getting tired because this was three rounds, but he had moments. He was actually winning. He actually, he looked like his hands was better than Dustin Jacoby. But the thing is with Macau, it seems like he has hands, but he seems like he's kind of limited, man. Like he's good. I'm comparing him to elite guys in the middleweight division, right? Because he's a real good fighter. It seems like he has a one-two and he has an overhand left and he moves his head real good and he can go to the body. He has a uh, brutal body shots and a brutal left uppercut. But other than that, man, it seems like he has limitations in striking. But you know what helps him with the limitations? Hand speed. Yeah. He's so much faster than a lot of these other guys. Granted, he's not as big as they are, but the hand speed, he can hit them. There's nothing they can do. And speaking of size, he's a middleweight now, so the size difference ain't really going to play it as much as in the light heavyweight division. His hand speed is just something that a lot of these guys cannot stop. When I'm looking at his wins, a lot of these guys are either not in the UFC or they're barely hanging on. I don't think it is. Shamil was undefeated when they fought. I know Shamil don't have that many fights in the UFC, but I never heard of uh, my Desta, so I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, but Shamil also only had, that was his second fight in the UFC, so we don't, we're not really going, we don't have too much to go off him. But I'm saying when you really look at the wins, the names aren't really there that you would expect to see because when he had boost in competition, he lost all three of those fights. And speaking of a boost in competition, Cody has now worked his way into the next tier of fighters. And McCall might be at the very bottom of that middle tier of fighters. So this is basically to see is Cody for real. If he can finish McCall, that would be a big statement for his career because he was not expected to win the Dolce fight, and he was not expected to win the Treshawn Gore fight. And he won both of those fights. And the Dolce fight don't age well. But I watched like a lot of film on Cody Brundage, and I'm seeing like a bunch of a uh, Hail Mary right hand, because even when he fought Treshawn Gore, before he landed it, he threw it like three or four times before that, but it got blocked each time. It's almost like he ducks his head and he throw the, the Hail Mary right hand, and if he landed, he could knock you out, but a lot of times he don't land it. So like, I'm not gonna say that Treshawn Gore was, uh, fight was luck, but it was a Hail Mary right hand. And then when he fought against Dolce, that was a Hail Mary guillotine. And I'm seeing him, I'm not gonna say he's getting lucky, but I think his luck runs out when he fight against Macau. I don't wanna be that guy, but when we look at two fighters who don't seem to have the best fight awareness, not right now, at least. Luckily, Treshawn has showed improvement in his last fight. But at the time where this fight took place, yeah. him and Dolce got to have some of the worst fight IQ that we've seen as and far as decision making. The point is he fought against people who decision making wasn't the best. And against the Rodolfo's and against the Macau's, it might be a little bit different. But then again, Macau got a couple of submissions lost on his record too, man, to yeah, where he dropped the ball because he hurt old Vince and got submitted. 
You know what I mean? And yeah, he got submitted by Jimmy Crude in one round as well. Oh yeah. So and we know Dustin Jacoby can get the job done, but he typically likes to stay away from the ground, even if he got a little bit better takedowns. What I'm gonna do is it might not be a lot of logic to it, but I'm just I'm high on Cody Brundis right now. He's starting to win these fights, he's starting to put them together. And the McCall fight against Sam Alvey was to keep him alive. That was to keep his confidence going and keep his career going in the UFC. But they definitely know that Cody is building steam. He might be going on a little win streak right now. Now, I don't know when that's going to end, but I don't think it ends against McCall. I just want to see what his takedown defense is. Uh, McCall, 50%, man. Dang, this is 50-50. I'm a big McCall, McCall fan. And uh, Cody, I don't think he can stand up with McCall. He has to get the fight to the ground, and which he can. I don't know, man. I don't know about this one, to be honest. I think he will. And one thing I've noticed is McCall's confidence has not looked the same. Like when he was undefeated in the UFC, it was like a completely different fighter. Yeah. Once he held a few L's, it seemed like he was just kind of fighting, trying to keep the fire alive. But it's just different. It's not like that same. Almost like, uh, what's Alexander Hernandez? Yeah, because McCall definitely has the striking and the speed advantage, obviously. But Cody's overall MMA game down the stretch should help him but this fight is only three rounds so if cody yeah. don't start getting the wrestling going into the second third round you it yeah. can start looking kind of funky when you get to the judge's decision but another thing is if he get the fight to the ground i believe he can submit mccall mccall i think he's going to learn from other people's mistakes too and uh he was, he's going to learn from dodge mistake and pick his shots you know and stay on the outside so what's your final prediction i'm, I'm gonna have to go with mccall by second round knockout i'm gonna go with cody brunage by second or third round submission at the very least a decision so on the next fight we have drew dober and bobby green we're gonna take a look at drew dober's record he is currently 25 and 11 standing five foot eight and has a reach of 70 inches on the other side we have bobby green who has a record of 29 and 13 standing 5 10 and has a reach of 71 inches. So he only has a one inch reach advantage over Drew Dober. This is a, it's definitely a striker versus striker fight. And I would like to pick Bobby Green, but the thing about Bobby is he does not fight the way you would think he would fight. With, this, with the skills and the tools that he has, he definitely should not have as many losses in the UFC that he has. He should have more wins. He was on a win streak before he took the Islam. He was on a two fight win streak before he lost to Islam. He took that fight on short notice and got obliterated. Yeah, but he lost to uh, Fiziel and uh, Tiago, and those were arguably robberies. Yeah. You know, so he, he might be on a seven fight win streak. But the, the thing about that is when you fight in a particular way to where whenever the fight goes to a decision, you constantly lose close fights. Well, when we go back and look at the actual fight, you make questionable decisions in fight yeah. that we know is going to backfire, but you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. That's one knock on Bobby Green is that the physical tools are there, the, the athleticism is there, the capability, but mentally, the decision making, this is almost like the Kevin Holland thing. It's like you give fights away. I think it's mental. I think fighters like that, it gives them a peace of mind. It gives them peace of mind before the fight because they can know I can go out there and if I lose, I can blame on being exciting instead of saying, you know what, you know what, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna try to win the fight. Because Saruki and, and some of these elite guys will go out there and try to win the fight, and they're not giving their opponents opportunities that they wouldn't nor that they wouldn't ordinarily have. One fight I'm reminded of real bad with Bobby Green Dustin. is the Dustin Poirier yeah. fight. You talk about some. You talk about getting nine lives and just giving every last one of them away. It, it was insane. Dustin steady dropping you, hurting you. You steady dropping your hands until he finally knocks you out unconscious. It just, I, I cannot stop thinking about that fight in my head. Then on the other end, we get Drew Dober. Drew Dober is on a two fight winning streak, but hey, check this out though. Before that, he lost two fights against Brad Riddell and against Islam Mashev. But in totality, he is one, two, three, 
four or five. He's five and two in his last seven fights. Jude Dober was having these fights where he would do good on the feet and then he'd, he'd get taken down or he'd take the fight to the ground and get submitted. We saw him do that several times. What was the one fight, man? Olivier, Olivier, no, Aubin, Mercier. He did it against, of all people, Benil too. Because he was hurting Benil, dropping Benil, and he just found a way to lose. And then even when he fought against Benil, man, there was moments where he got taken down and got back up. Got taken down, got back up, man. And he just, whenever you get like, whenever it's restarts like that, man, like, you think, I think Bobby Green would have fought against Islam and the fight where he got back up. I think is I mean I think Bobby Green would have paid I think he would have paid to have a I think he would have paid to have a restart against Islam with a fight would have been back on the feet. Which he was gonna get taken out regardless because the way he fight, but uh Drew Dover against Benil, man, the fight was on his feet a couple times and he just found a way to lose. Yeah, you we basically have a fight here with two guys who have the ability and the potential to be ranked way higher than what they currently are but they just find ways to give fights up. I think that the UFC is not really holding the Islam fight against Bobby because he took that fight on a week's notice. So basically he's on a two fight win streak and he's fighting somebody on a two fight win streak. This fight was probably gonna happen regardless of the Islam fight. But for this fight, we know Bobby Green is coming in with head movement, a lot of finesse. But one thing he doesn't have is that one punch knockout power. We see it here and there. But then we might see it once and we might not see it for seven or eight more fights. And with Drew Dober, we know he has a lot of punching ability. We know he has a great chin. We know he want to keep the fight standing up. Heavy leg kicks, heavy punches. I just think that he's more consistent. You know, prior to the um, Terrence McKinney fight, he had never been knocked down. I didn't know that. Yeah, so he had like the most fights in the UFC without being knocked down. So it was like, that was just crazy crazy uh, stat you had. Well, yeah, well, just looking at how both fighters fight, Bobby Green can have these quote-unquote exciting fights sometimes, but in all truth, well, a lot of times the fights are not as exciting as people try to make them out to be. It'd be action, Pat. It don't be like Clay Guido versus uh, Diego Sanchez. It wasn't like that. It's mostly, it's a lot of showmanship from Bobby Green. It's not the actual fight. Yeah. It's a lot of him doing weird little antics taunts and all that taunts in the fight but it's not necessarily his fight output that's making it exciting yeah. like if you go look at Drew Dober and Rafael Alves yeah that fight was exciting because they were both doing things there was some taunting and some yeah. showmanship in that fight as well but they were actually fighting and that's the thing you ever notice it with the exception of against grapplers you ever notice that Drew Dober he's good at fighting his type of fight against against strikers like when he fought against Nasrat, no, we're gonna fight you my way. I'm gonna get on the inside and I'm gonna throw this left hand. And I can see him doing it to Bobby Green. I can see Bobby Green trying to fight on the outside and fight his way. And I can see I can see uh Drew Dober on the inside and just tagging him. There's the one off chance that Bobby could show up and fight the way he's supposed to fight with his athleticism and his skills. But I've been watching enough fights to know that even if he even if there was a chance that he would do it, I'm not betting on it. And, and this is, look, I've been watching Bobby Green since Strike Force. I've been watching Bobby for a very long time. That's why I know to pick Drew. Because Drew, at least, is more consistent, and Bobby does not have the skill set. Like, when you go really look at, let's look at his past few losses. Benil, Olivier, Arben, Mercier, Islam. Dude, Bobby Green don't fight like none of those people. The closest person he fights like would be Brad Riddell, but the difference is, Brad is somewhat intentional when he fights. I know the last few fights, he took yeah. on more than he could handle. But I'm saying before that point, Brad is trying, like he fights with intent. I'm yeah. trying to do this. I'm trying to outpoint you for three rounds. I'm trying to keep the fight standing up. Bobby, it's a lot of dropping your hands and dipping low, like doing the whole James Tony thing. But this will make it odd because Rafael Alves was doing amazing against Drew Dober. And then he got caught with a body punch. Terrence McKinney was doing great, but obviously he gassed out. He took the fight on short notice. But you would think Bobby would be able to look at fights like those and and learn, but he's not. And I think Drew resembles 
people who be Bobby Green more than Bobby Green resemble people who be Drew Dober. For example, man, like we talking about power. Who has Bobby Green with the exception of Lando? And Lando sometimes his knockout power will be there, other times it don't. So he's a weird one. But um don't Drew Dober resemble Dustin a little bit when it comes to power? Not when it comes to striking. And then on top of that, Dustin has power in his left hand. Drew Dober has power in his left hand. Bro, I can see Drew doing what Dustin did and to my Francisco Chinado left handed. Uh, Southpaw? Uh, I don't think I don't, so. I don't think so. But it's just, you look at the record and you look at the unnecessary losses. And I know Drew has a few on his as well. But this is the difference. I've seen more maturity and growth from Drew Dober than I've seen from Bobby Green. Like, you can actually see Drew getting better in these fights, even the fights he lost against Islam. I mean, how was he supposed to win that fight? And also, if Bobby Green gonna win, it's gonna be by decision. If Drew gonna win, it's gonna be by the it's gonna be by knockout or decision. So if this fight go three rounds, Bobby Green gonna win. That's that's one thing I just can't stop thinking about. If this fight go three rounds, how many decision wins do Drew Dorber got in the UFC? He don't have a bunch of decision wins. Most of his wins come by knockout. So I'm saying, if this fight go three rounds, I can see Bobby winning this. But Bobby loses a lot of close fights. A lot of a yeah, lot but, of the fights that Bobby lost, man. But we don't really count. I'm gonna be honest. It's certain fights he had that nobody really count as a loss. Man, they count a lot of them as losses. Man, he lost to Rafael. He lost to Tiago. He lost to Francisco. He lost to Jay Carr. Dude, these are close fights that you. When you outstrike your, when you outstrike your opponent by forty. But strikes. it don't matter the way he fights. He gives his opponent opportunities to look like they're doing more than what they are. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, his fighting style causes him to lose close fights dropping your hands and ducking and dodging but you're not throwing strikes another thing is Bobby does his thing he want to counter you he want to counter and land the perfect punch and, and another with Bobby even when his striking starts looking good and he starts flowing he finds a way to mess it up he finds a way to not follow through with it like if Drew Dober starts landing he gonna be looking for a knockout punch and he gonna be hunting trying to get it if Bobby starts finding his range and his rhythm what he gonna do start playing around to where the fight gonna be close enough to where he'll ultimately lose it. I'm picking Drew Dober. Uh, I'm a big Drew Dober fan. I'm picking Bobby Green, man. I, I got a feeling if this fight go three rounds, it's more than likely Drew is not gonna win a decision over Bobby Green. If this fight go three rounds, he more than likely gonna win by knockout. And this fight more than likely gonna go three rounds too. So I'm gonna have to go Bobby Green by decision. All these good decisions Bobby got on his record. So I'm saying that he outstruck this guy by 40, this guy by 40. But he's still out. But, because, like, but, but because of his style, it doesn't look like he's winning. That's the whole point is, even with all that being said, he fights in a way that where he always gives his opponents opportunities to get back in the fight. That's a big knock on That's Bobby Green. That's a big knock on Bobby and Green. And sometimes he don't finish his opponent. Well, not sometimes. But even when he get his rhythm and the motion going, landing strikes, he will not finish the fight. Because you will come back and knock something out, man, if you don't finish him. Especially, I don't think he's going to respect Bobby Green knockout power either. And he, even if Bobby's doing well, Bobby going to do, he going to make some off-the-mark decision in the fight that's going to lead to Drew Dober being able to get back in the fight. I can see that happening. But then, in another matchup where you got two guys who they could, they could be winning and then they could find ways to lose, we get Alex Caceres and Julian Erosa. Alex is 19 and three, standing at five foot 10, has a reach of 73 and a half. Then Julian Erosa is 28 and 10, standing 6'1", and has a reach of 74 and a half. Hey, I found something out about Julian Erosa. He's been knocked down by people throwing their left hook from a southpaw position. Sean Woodson was in southpaw position. He dropped him with a left hook. I ain't got to tell you what happened in the, uh, the Sung Woo Choi fight. He knocked him out with a left hook. Julio Aris knocked him out with a left head kick from the southpaw position. Uh, Charles Jodane, he knocked him down with a uh, left hook from the southpaw position. Alex Caceres, he might get the job done, man, by knockout with a left hook. I can see that coming. It's just hard to bet on Alex, man, because you talk about you get a mixed match. His record 19 and 13 for a reason. It's hard to pick him with any type of high confidence, but at the same time, it's hard to pick Julian with any type of high confidence either because 
We've seen Julian look really impressive, and then he'll go out there. He'll look impressive for two or three fights, and then the next fight he'll go out there and get totally destroyed. And you just don't really know what to expect from him. But it's weird because Sung Wu Choi, of all people, got wins over both of these guys. But uh, oh yeah, I forgot he no, didn't no. beat Alex. Oh yeah, that's what I was gonna say. He didn't beat Alex. He dropped him. Well, he hurt Alex, and he he didn't finish him. And uh, Alex came back and beat him. But the thing is, that's nothing with Alex. Sometimes, bro, he can be kind of. I don't know if he gonna be all the way there mentally, or if he gonna be focused, man. But sometimes it takes for him to get hurt to kind of actually start fighting. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. And the thing is with Julian Rosa, man, like he can't take the same damage as Alex, man, because the, the damage that Alex can take, Julian will be knocked out. But you gotta understand, dude, like they both are the same guy, and soon Wu Choi knocked Julian out, and he hurt Alex. And Alex came back and beat him. But Alex has some help too. Yeah, I know, man. It was kind of some weird stuff going on. But so check this out. Julian Erosa, since 2020, he only got one loss. That's to Soon Wu Choi. You go look at Alex Caceres' record. Since 2019, he only lost one fight. That was against Sadiq Yusuf. Alex low key is, is doing really good. And so deep, man. I'm real high on so deep. So losing to so deep ain't really the worst thing. He's so dangerous. It's like, man, like lose to somebody. He's gonna be in top five one day. So it's like losing to somebody like so deep ain't nothing to feel bad about. The only thing is I can't let go is the fact that Julian be winning fights, man. He just get knocked out of nowhere. And then sometimes he'll fight somebody and get hurt and come back and submit them in the third round. Then next time he'll get hurt and get knocked out. And it's like, you don't know what to expect from his chin. His chin is real inconsistent. Yeah. Hey, I'm looking at his record, though, man. He finished Sean Wilson. He finished Nate Landwehr. He finished Charles Jordan. Hey, that Nate, they, that Nate Landwehr fight, man, like, he hurt him with a knee. I think it was an early stoppage. I know a lot of people are going to, like, grill me for saying this, man, but. He was going to get him out of there, man. He was. Uh, it, it, it don't even. I don't know. I'm looking at his other wins. He he done submitted people with dark chokes. He was gonna submit him, bro. I don't know, man. The Devontae Smith, Grant Dawson, Julio Ars. He can be beat, man. Like, yeah, but you gotta realize the people you just named, uh, Alex Caceres don't fight like none of those people. Yeah, these guys, they got some knockout power. They and Grant Dawson has that wrestling background. That's completely, totally different. But as far as this fight, man. Is soon is soon the southpaw? Uh, he knocked him out in the southpaw position. I think he's a southpaw, or I think he switched stances at the very least. Man, both these guys got a lot of finishes. It's just I'm gonna be real, man. Like it's kind of hard to bet against Julian in this situation because yeah, he make mistakes and he loses here and there, but he has wins over the more stellar competition. And uh, yeah, Alex, he can beat like mid-tier fighters. Who has Alex beat who was like in the top 10? He hasn't beat nobody in the top 10. Julian ain't even, so. He beat people who are in the top 15. Yeah, but Charles Jordan, that ain't a bad one. Yeah, but Charles' losses is starting to add up on him now, man. It's to the point and where. That's Sean Woodson, that's a good one too, man. And then we, uh, Alex, he has been susceptible on the ground too, because he has some submission losses. I'm calling it, man. Julian Rosa, third round submission. Does that sound good? It got a little ring to it, though. I'm not mad at that, man. It depends. If Alex on a win streak, man, he he unbeatable. We on a win streak, but when he lose, and his only loss came from Sadiq. Sadiq as of late, and Sadiq can beat Julian. So let me see. I don't know about this one. Man. Yeah, man. I'm gonna have to go with Alex just because. I like the win streak. I think that Julian has faced better competition over the course of his win streak. But the difference is a lot of those fights Julian was losing until he came back and found a way to win. But we've seen Alex win their fights and find a way to lose and get submitted. Yeah, but that, but again, he hasn't lost outside of Sadiq since 2019. That's true. So, but a lot of the people that he beat Kevin Krohn, who are these Austin people? Springer, are these Chase people, Hooper. These people are not even in the, in the UFC anymore. 
other than Chase, and Chase is barely hanging on by a thread. So the only per they, he fought somebody making their debut. So the person he beat that has the most, or uh, who has the most, I don't know, credibility, yeah, is uh, Sun Wu Choi, and that has an asterisk next to it, man. Ah, yeah, this is a tough one, man. And Julian, he going Julian be winning fights he ain't supposed to win though, and he can go out there and find a way to win. Julian has never been submitted. That's the only way Alex gonna win, huh? By submission. He ain't never been submitted. I think both these guys are overrated, if I'm gonna just be honest, man. But a low key. I think these guys are you think they're the uh, the worst out of the elite guys, or you think they're the best out of the mid tiers? Where you rank these guys, man? man I think they the worst I'm, out I'm, of the uh, elites. When you look at Alex's record, bro, he beat a bunch of people on his win streak that these are people who have to be messed up a certain type of way. Chase Hooper. Soon still can't get it together. Sun still can't get it together. Kevin Kroon ain't there no more. Austin Springer, don't even know who that is. Steven Peterson shouldn't be there. I, You're supposed to be on the win streak. I want to pick Julian, man, but I've seen him find ways to lose enough. I'm going to pick Alex. Who are you picking? I'm going with Julian by submission. I don't know which round. I'm not opposed to that. I'm going to just pick Alex just because I like the win streak and I might change my mind. I might have to double back on that one. And, and, and uh, We'll see I'm fighting. Now. So I've watched both of them fight enough to where I know neither one of these guys are dependable. That's the only thing I know for sure about this fight. Now, speaking of... Okay. So the next fight we have is Amir Albazi versus Alessandro Costa. Let's go stand. Hold on. Actually, we didn't even look at none of this. How about you had UFC stats up? Yeah, Julian might win. If I just keep the fight on the feet, he has a chance. But anyway, then we go to Amir Albazi. Albazi, he makes it very clear what his game plan is. From watching Alessandro's fights, he actually fights a little bit like Albazi. It's pretty much almost the same Number thing. Two. Hey, you know what I thought you was gonna say? Hey, don't laugh. Minus, he don't throw kicks like Marlon Moraes. He kind of fight like Marlon on the feet. Yeah. He can be kind of reckless, reckless with the throwing everything in the one with yeah. in every single punch. And if he land, he got what a let me see, a twelve second knockout on his record, man. It just shows you how much heat he has. Yeah. And he he only has two losses in his entire career. One of those was a split decision. Hey, when he fought against Diego Ortiz. He got knocked down, man, because he tried to blitz him. He tried to do that uh, Drikas, uh blitz and got countered. And that's one thing I'm kind of worried about. The only thing is, Amir ain't going to capitalize on that. You know what's funny? Sometimes you get two grapplers and they fight and the grappler counsel out and they strike. Amir don't fight like that, man. Even if his opponent has good grappling, the fight going to hit the ground. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm picking Albazi because of the fact that Last week we had TJ Brown and we had Eric Silva. And we saw Eric, he destroyed all of this pre-UFC competition. And then when he gets over to the UFC, you would think that all those submissions and all those finishes would translate to something in the UFC. And I see what you're saying. Guess what happened? All those submission wins didn't mean Jack is squat. It's only one thing, man. Alessandro is the takedown defense. If he can stuff Amir takedowns, Amir, his striking ain't bad. He just got like basic striking. He really throw like leg kicks and everything just straight and fast. Cause we know what he's trying to do. He's trying to get the fight to the ground. Cause then he can do whatever he want to. But um, but the thing is, if some kind of way Alessandro can stuff the takedowns and make it his type of fight, he can easily get the knockout. I'm not saying he's going to, but like that's something that can happen. Yeah. They fight similar, and when I was watching Alessandro's fights, I started thinking, they basically have a similar game plan. They're going to try to swarm and throw everything into the strikes and get close enough to go for a takedown. They're both, they both have the same game plan for all their fights. The only thing is, as of late, Alessandro has been standing up with people more and knocking people out. He might be, I'm not comparing him to Ilya, but like, you know, it could be one of them things where you start off as a grappler and your hands get better. 
because it, it looked like each fight, Alexandra hands and striking is getting a little bit better. And he got a lot of power. So it's like, man, I just think, you know what's going to separate two, man? It's just uh, IQ. And it, I'm, I'm going to say experience, too, because the Malcolm Gordon fight, hey, that was just a good little W. But then when you can be in there with Zaugus, I know that it was a decision, but that's a lot of experience to be in there with somebody like that. That's just a lot of experience for 15 minutes. Especially in a fight where it's hard to take Zaugus down and hold him down, but, and Zaugus is going to take downs. But wait a minute, though. If you couldn't submit Zaugus, man, and... Yeah, but Zaugus get a bad rep because he done lost several fights in the road. He probably should have won. I know. I understand what you're saying. Zaugus is well-rounded. He's durable. But, but what I'm saying is if you can't take down Alessandro and say the grappling counsel out, man, all it takes is one punch from Alessandro. The fight can be over. Yeah, but Alessandro is also not very accurate. A lot of the opponents that he was doing it to those blitz, that was that was low-level competition that you're supposed to be able to do that against. That's why I said, like, uh, this fight will come down to Amir's IQ. Because when you go yeah, back and look at it, man, this particular person was 6-3. and three. He didn't have the experience. Who else? Uh, he, his record actually is straight. I'm not even going I'm not even going to hold you. Hey, yeah, I, it's one thing I got to say. Like, I'm picking Amir, but... It's not a confident pick. I'm gonna tell you why. I know this was years ago, but in 2019, Amir fought a guy named Jose Torres. Uh, I don't know if you saw the fight, man, but Amir couldn't take him down. He actually, uh, Jose was actually taking down Amir. And Amir didn't lose bad, but it was a big, strong wrestler who he couldn't take down. And he had power in his punches. And Amir really was frustrated in that fight. And I'm not comparing that guy to Alexandro because until you fight in the UFC, man, like, we got to assume that you're not that good. Yeah. We got to assume that, man, until you show it. But at the same time, if he's, if you can compare his body type and his skill set to Jose, he might give a mere trouble. You know, after watching both of them, after watching film on both of them and seeing that they fight similarly and they fight similarly, I'm going to lean more towards Al Bazi because he's been able to do oh, yeah. the same thing in the UFC. That alone lets me know he can get the job done with the bright lights on. I'm picking Amir al -Bazi. And this last thing I'm going to say, because um, Amir has that Habib-type style to where his striking defense is really good, probably better than what we think. And it's good enough to avoid getting knocked out by a smile like Alexandra. I'm not saying it will work against Brandon Moreno or any of them guys, but it definitely, I think it'll work against Alexandra. So I'm picking Amir. And I think this is going to be real competitive. I'm going by split. He's going to find a way to get the job done. Yeah, just because of the experience, man. Because Pop, I mean, because Costa wants to swarm, hit you with big punches, ultimately grab you, take you down, and submit you. Albazi wants to do the same thing, except for he's just a little bit more safe on the feet. But he. And he seems like he has more understanding of his opponent's strength and their weaknesses. And he fight towards his strength. It seems like he does his research on his opponent. And then at the very least, even if they do try to implement a similar game plan, Albazi, his cardio and being able to do that and have the UFC experience against tough competition like Zargas. Yeah. I just, I, I, got, I got to pick him, man. Yeah. Okay. In the next fight, we have lightweights. Arman Sarukian versus Damir Ismagulov. Now, Arman is currently 18-3. and three. He's standing 5'7 seven with 72 and a half inch reach. On the other side, we have Demir Ismagulov with a record of 24 and 1, standing 5'10 and having a reach of 74 inches. That's a lot. That's a lot. And, and he's not to use it too. So this is the thing. With Armand being 5'7 and being at a disadvantage in the reach, we know his game plan is gonna be to get in, close the distance and try to wrestle and go from there because this fight in my mind from looking at both fighters i think this fight gonna look almost like the gamera fight there's only one issue with that look at demir's takedown defense it's, it's, I, know, I, know. I don't know why he took this fight man he gotta do a better job armand gotta do a better job of taking more favorable fights where i get on the win streak and then look at uh what patty's doing look at what islam did it's like, bro, you got to do a better job. Because then now, even if you can beat the champions, the people in the top five, you're not going to make it there because you're fighting people with bad matchups. And none of those guys will take fights like this against somebody with a 24-1 and record. 
who got yeah. they got knockout power and they got submissions, but they know how to win a majority of their fights by decision. Yeah. And none of those guys will take a dangerous fighter that's a high risk, low reward fight. And then even uh, what's his name, Garam? Yeah, even Gar- we fight against Garam. That fight was close, man. He that found was a, a way to win. He yeah. found a way to win, man. And he, it was real close, man. But the thing is. But this, speaking of that fight, Garam had a lot of success when he closed the distance. And yeah. With, but one area of the fight where Garam was able to have success against Damir was whenever he was able to get him in a clinch and throw elbows and knees. It seemed like he didn't hurt Damir, but. It was very clear that Damir was like, no, nah, I don't want nothing to do with that. And so he was always either trying to fight on the inside and score takedowns himself, or he wanted to control the fight at range and throw that slick one-two. Because he got a slick one-two punch that he throws, but it's always just to set up a takedown. One thing that's really weird about Damir, it looks like his punches are like hooks, but then it's, it's like they're very wide and loopy punches. But then sometimes they land like they're straight punches. I just don't understand how he's doing it. So Armand has to be very careful about not fighting him at distance and fighting him at range. Armand's going to have to close the distance and try to wrestle him. But even Garam couldn't even do that, man. And the thing is, Armand is not a striker. He has good striking, but for some reason, who was that he knocked out, man? And they were saying how he's... It's like, bro, he's not a striker. He's a wrestler. He's a grappler. Well, he knocked out uh, Christos, uh, Gigagos. Mm-hmm. You know what's funny about that fight? Yeah, I'm not taking nothing away from this fight. Well, Christos, he stuffed a couple of takedowns. He stuffed a takedown, and he ended up on top of Armand at one point, man. Nobody talked about this. And then they both stood back up. And, you know, he had to get caught with a left hook. You know, he found a way to lose. But I'm thinking, like, man, if... If Damir can stuff some takedowns, but then fights your type of fight, man. But his only type of fight is trying to fight from the outside and a uh, point fight. But Saruki and his inside game ain't the best. We ain't talking about if we if we were talking about like somebody like Gamrot or somebody do like who could fight more so on the inside, then it'd be a different story. But you know Saruki, he like to fight. He's good on the inside. Like you know he can throw knees and he got like some like spinning back fists. He got some uh, sneaky attacks. But at the same time, like, he ain't the most comfortable on the inside either. So I think he could do enough to score points, man. But I don't think he could do enough to win rounds on the inside. I tell you what, this was a terrible fight to take from Armand because Dabmir, it seemed like he was made specifically to be able to beat somebody like Armand because he can control the, the range. And then even if you get close enough up on him, his wrestling is so good, you might not even be able to get the takedown. The only thing that's going to favor into Armand is that is that Damir likes to control the pace of a fight. You might be able to beat him if you can make him fight at your pace and not necessarily let him get comfortable at range or get comfortable even even if he's stuffing takedowns, if you can just mix it up and basically get him tired, that would be the only and I don't I'm not even saying that would work. I'm just saying it seems like that's what the game plan gonna have to be because you're not gonna beat him grappling. You're not just gonna beat him striking because how you gonna get close to him? Another thing is Saru can throw one strike at a time. You ever notice that? He don't really throw punches and bunches like that. He throw a left hook, he might throw a right straight, he might throw a knee or, or a jab or something, but it's not like four or five strike combination. And I think that's where Garam had some success against Damir. And the it, thing is, and even if it's go fight go three rounds, man, like this a type of fight that benefits Damir, man. Like he liked these close fights. You know, and Sarukin, so even if he do win, man, like you keep going these, you keep going three rounds or the full distance, five rounds with these fights, these with these rounds. tough title contenders mm-hmm. who could one day were fighting for title contention or fighting these number one contenders, and all the top guys know to stay away from the the Gamrots and the Damir. They stand away from these people, and you lining them up, and now you messing up your win streak, and now you messing up your opportunities because you never know. Justin Gaethje might not come back for a while. Dustin might sit back for a while. Anything can happen to where that next group of guys who's not Dustin Poirier, Michael Chandler, Justin Gaethje, those guys that come after that, the Raphael Fazios and stuff, like you don't know what opportunities could be there waiting for you. Like how Jamal Hill just got a title fight. Now imagine if he went out there and was taking bad matchups and lost. Now 
you you don't get you get no title shot. Not even that, but in the lightweight division, it's kind of weird, kind of like the light heavyweight division, because you know um, what, because we know what happened when Charles got stripped and stuff. So it's been some stuff that's been going on with some weird stuff in the lightweight division too. So we can't the, act like this too far fetched. The title been vacated several times to where anybody who was up yeah. there can fight for it. Oh, People yeah. retired. At one point, I think. Uh, at one point, I think Tony and Khabib was champion at the same time, right? Or Tony, no, I interim think, titles. Yeah, so it's like you had two different champions at one point at the same time. And we know it lightweight people steady keep getting injured in these big fights, especially especially these title fights. So if you're just winning, you can put yourself in a position to where you can actually get a, a title shot, you know. But I think this is a tough matchup. Yeah, but, uh, him versus Damir. I don't think. But I'm, but I'm a supporter him anyway. I'm gonna go with Armand. I'm not. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Damir. The reason why I'm picking Damir is how is Armand gonna win? Because okay, if you look at the Joel Alvarez fight, he took him down, they grinded upon him. Well, Damir has the rest. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Okay, he has power when his left hook. Because we, I, I didn't see Armand. He hurt a lot of people with left hook, man. That's it ain't gonna strike. land on. It ain't gonna, gonna land on. It's yet. too, it's too uh, wide. It's too wide. And to then, go, and then with his reach disadvantage, the only way Armand can win is he got to mix it up. And I'm not saying mixing it up is gonna win. I'm saying he's got to use his energy to mix it up on Damir so that Damir can can get tired. So then maybe one of those areas might open up because once you start getting yeah. exhausted, then you, your hands are lower than they normally would be. Or your takedown defense is not as good. That's the only way. That, that's the only way our month will win. We want to tell you another thing. I'm gonna say, man. The last thing I'm gonna say about this fight is, it seems like Armand' game and his style doesn't really work in his favor when it comes to the scoring and the judging. For example, like when he fought against when he fought against Gamrock, it was certain positions he had when he was on the side of Gamrock, and it wasn't really scoring points for whatever reason. But then when certain things Gamrock was doing to him, he was scoring points. And the same thing with Islam. He had Islam in certain positions to where, like, because Armand, he liked to hold people down in weird positions, man. And he got to change his game up like that, man. Like, it's good he, against – they might work against you Dover, man, but against people in the top ten. He, like He needs to be aware of what's going on in the cage. Even during the Gamrock fight, somebody was saying leading up to that fight that Armand didn't know that he was supposed to be finishing fights. I'm like, what do you mean? You didn't know you were supposed to be no finishing fights. Prior what to are you him, trying to say? No, prior to him finishing, who he finished first, man? Uh, oh, Christos. Prior to him finishing Christos, he said, uh, he said, somebody told me that I have to start finishing fights now. And it's like, what? Somebody told you? You don't know that you should be finishing fights. And that lack of awareness, and then for some reason, his corner not letting him know how close that fight was against Gamrot, which I thought Armand won. Yeah. I didn't even think it was that super close. I think that whatever margin whatever the slimmest margin of victory is, I think Armand should have had it. But yeah. the the fact of the matter is, for your corner to, to not let you know, hey, this fight is close, and you need this fifth round. It's it just, hey, man, man, I'm gonna tell you another thing, man. I noticed, I'm gonna tell you another thing from watching this left, well, I'm gonna tell you another thing from uh, watching the uh, Armand versus Gamera fight. Sometimes, Saru can, can end up in bad positions. Cause I noticed it was a couple times against Gamera, especially in that fifth round, he was winning the fight and he just ended the round on the bottom. It just looked bad. It looked way worse than what it really was. Even if he was winning for four minutes before that, you end the round on your back. You can't get up. It's it just bad for the optics. Man. Yeah, man. But and this is a, this why I said this is a terrible matchup. But I'm going with Armand because I feel like he's supposed to do something special in the division. And I don't know what it is yet, but he gonna have to prove it in this fight. With low confidence, I'm picking Armand Sarukin. Uh, I'm picking Dimir. I, I just think Armand on. I don't think he's limited in the way he can do to Damir. I'm picking uh, Damir by decision. Okay, so now we make our way into the main event. We get former title contender Jared Cannonier at 15 and 6, standing 5'11 with a reach of 77 and a half, going up against Sean Strickland, currently 25 and 4, standing 6'1 with 76 inch reach. Um, since we know this fight more than likely gonna be a stand-up fight, let me go look at the stand-up statistics here. Hey, surprisingly, Jared don't have that many knockdown average, probably because he just knocked people out. Yeah, I mean, you know, it ain't gonna knock down. And then when we go here, so obviously, like we all thought, Sean, he lands more punches per minute, but Jared has a higher percentage of significant strikes, which 
So that means Sean will throw more volume, but that just means that the punches that Jared does land, they're gonna hold more weight to it, which is what anybody could see from just watching the fight. When you look at the punches absorbed per minute for Jared, you got 3.5 strikes. And then Sean Strickland absorbs basically four strikes per minute. And the defense is similar with Jared having 61% defense and Sean having 65% defense. The grappling, they not really gonna be over there all like that. So, so I'ma just call it like I see it, man. When we seen Sean go to war with Jack Hermanson for five rounds standing up, and that wasn't too long ago. And then he got starched and absolutely obliterated by Alex Pereja. And Jared just had a bad fight with Izzy where he couldn't land anything. Because Izzy was just fighting that type of way. I don't think that there was anything Sean could have done that would have been much differently. But on the opposite end, I don't think Jared would have got knocked out in one minute. By yeah, Alex. by Alex. Yeah, he would last. Maybe in minute two or three. Yeah, he would have lasted not, 30 seconds longer. Yeah, he, he would have lasted a few minutes longer. But I'm going to just call it, I'm going with Jared. Because even with Sean having more volume and Sean going to have more output, the fact of the matter is Sean is not a knockout threat. Sean is also not a wrestler. Jared can resort to wrestling, and you always got to be worried about the 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 punching power. In oh. addition to that, dude, he's not just a one-punch knockout artist guy. He's actually smart on the feet. But sometimes we can see guys like Robert Whitaker was able to frustrate Jared with the hands. I can see Sean. Just it, it wasn't just that, dude. Robert is so good that Robert does a lot of things that most people can't replicate. Now, you got to realize uh, Robert went in off that performance and got a title fight and arguably beat the champion. Sean Strickland ain't finna do that. The one thing that stands out is Jack was able to have success against Sean Strickland with leg kicks. And Jared has powerful leg kicks. And I see Jared just blasting it. Cause I think on the feet, I don't think Jared gonna land the, he might as well don't even throw that right hand. He ain't gonna land that. No. But uh, I think that the leg kick's gonna be there. Definitely. Sean won a split decision over Jack. He barely beat Jack, Jack Hermanson. So it's like if Jared could just land more body, more uh, leg kicks, and uh, if there's opportunity to land a right hand, throw it. But I'm gonna have to go with Sean Strickland on this one. Just the matchup. It just, it's just the matchup. The Jared man, like he could be a shell at times. I just don't like that. I like fighters who can let their the hands fly. And yeah, but the thing is, Sean can let his hands go, and it doesn't seem to do any damage. But he, he's doing enough damage to score points. So this is MMA. This is not who hit the hardest. I know, but the that's the thing about Jared. He's coming in not just having one punch knockout power. He got high kicks. He got elbows. He's got he's got knees. He's got clinch. We've seen him take Derek Brunson down and elbow him and ground and pound him. Yeah, but Derek Brunson, like no, but I'm saying, how many people with knockout power would still take the fight to the ground and try to use that knockout power there as well? Fighters normally don't do that. Not with that particular skill set. So Jared. Now, like you said, he can be he can shell up sometimes. He can be too calculated. He can wait around to see what his opponent's doing. But you got to realize, Sean Strickland is still coming off of a knockout loss. And all these guys who got knocked out and they taking these fights, uh, they're taking these fights two or three months later. They get knocked out again. Yeah, but getting knocked out by six foot four, six foot five, Alex Pereira, and now, and now, the champion now. But dude, we can't forget how dangerous Jared was just because he got beat by Izzy. We can't look at that. I think that's the only reason that people think this fight is closer than what it probably gonna be. Because Jared didn't land nothing against Izzy. But well, Sean was on a five fight win streak, man. Prior, what, well, six fight win streak prior to the Alice and, fight. But, but, and then you know what's funny about that? The fun thing is he should not have taken the Alice fight to begin with. Because say he doesn't take this Alice fight, say he fights somebody else, like a Derrick Bronson or somebody, and beats him. Because it's inevitable for him to fight uh, Alex Jared, anyway. Anyway. Yeah, Jared. Oh, or Alex. Anyway. So I'm saying, so say, uh, say he fights Jared, but this time he's on the six fight win streak, seven fight win streak. Does that matter that he lost to Alex? You get what I'm saying? I'm saying like, cause I don't think he should fought Alex to begin with. He should be fighting Jared Cunningham on a six fight win streak, which that's his fault for taking the fight, man. Yeah, but the way that Sean, it's almost like he knew he was gonna get knocked out, and he was playing around at the press conference, and he was joking around, acting like he don't have to fight Alex. Like, well, he was joking around to Izzy, making jokes about him getting knocked out. Meanwhile, the person who knocked him out, you have to fight him on Saturday. This is where Sean, this is where Sean lost me. When somebody asked him who's the best striker on stage, 
and he said the guy right here who beat Israel, he was kind of like, hold on, like, why would you say the guy who beat Israel when shouldn't you be saying you're the best striker on stage? And then to me, while I turn around and get starts the next few days afterwards, and this is like the way Sean accepted it and it happened. Yeah. It was like all the tough guy, all the weird stuff just went out the window, and he just basically kind of folded on. In which I'm saying it sounds bad, right? But obviously, it's only so many people in the world that could do that to Sean Strickland. I'm not just, I'm not just yeah. making light work of it or whatever the case, because obviously Alex went on to win the belt. But it's just man, Sean. I think that the running forward, just throwing jab, you don't have no power punch, you don't have no real fight ending ability. Meanwhile, Jared can outpoint him and he can knock him out and finish him doing the fight. I don't think fight. he can outpoint Sean Strickland. That's his game, man. If that's the worst thing Jared can do, go out there and try to outpoint people. But you made a good point, though. But with, with the Alex. leg kicks, man, he's know, definitely going to. He gonna. It's not just going to be hands and but knock out. But he did it for five rounds, though. That's but he's saying. fought for five rounds before. You got to realize that Derek Brunson fight was a title. That was for a title contention. And you, more, and you, you beating Kelvin Gaskell for five rounds. For Kelvin, you flip a coin. You never know which version you get from him. Yeah, but. But depending on which version you get, Sean might not be able to beat Kelvin. Depending on which, oh no, Sean could beat every. He could be the be the best version of Kelvin Gaston. But the thing is, you lost to but, one but guy who's a current be, champion. The fact that Sean lost to the guy who's a current champion who beat Israel and dethroned him, it really doesn't look as bad now. When you look back and say, "Oh yeah, he lost to Alex Rea," it's not as bad as it was at the time. You know what I mean? He still lost and got knocked out and like couple minutes man but yeah I gotta go with Sean on this one man it's just Jared he's too tentative he could be real tentative at times sometimes he don't pull the trigger a lot of times he do most of the time he do man but like man I'm looking at the people that beat I just yeah, see Sean. I'm looking at the people that beat Jared Jan Blackowitz Dominic Reyes Robert Whitaker Israel all champions Glover Texeda all nah, champion the only person nah, the only person who huh Reyes won't champion no, he fought for the belt though, and a lot of yeah. people think he was supposed to be the champion. Oh yeah, true. The only person that beat Sean, I mean, the only person that beat Jared that wasn't a champion was his first UFC fight. That was Sean Jordan. Everybody else was either a champion or they fought for the belt. I'm sorry, man. I gotta go with I gotta go with uh, Jared here. You think you can get the knockout or a decision? At the very least, it's gonna be a decision. Yeah, I didn't like that when Sean fought against Jack, and he was just he wasn't really checking the leg kicks at all. He was just walking forward, man, and just. But, and because I mean, he kind of let Jack do too much on the feet, especially the way Jack stand up was looking at the time. Jack was able to make that fight competitive just by throwing leg kicks because, you know, the hands was not there. And I think at some point with, for Sean Strickland, you fighting these guys at the top, you have to have some knockout power. You, do, you Not can't, necessarily. Hold on. You can't take people to the ground and submit them. And you can't knock them down. You can't hurt them or finish them on the feet. Did Izzy have knockout power? Yeah, but they couldn't touch Izzy. That's the difference. And Izzy was a champion. So it really don't matter because Izzy became champion in what a year. So let me ask you this: What if Sean start? What if he start to frustrate Jared early on? Like first what, two what's going to be more frustrating than when you just fought Izzy? You got to realize once you fought Izzy, everything else after that is like it's. It ain't a cakewalk, but I'm saying you surely had to learn something from the Izzy fight. Meanwhile, everything that happened to Sean in his last fight could very well happen again. This no, it's not. Because another thing is, it's not like Jared. Alex is a counter puncher. Jared, right hand, overhand, right. No, and then left hook, jab. It's it's, it's more than. I'm saying like he ha yeah he has a lot he has left hook. But I'm saying he don't have that counter game that Alex has. Like Jared, he like to get people against cage and throw his his combinations, his strikes. I think Sean's gonna control the center of the octagon. And he's gonna have Jared to where Jared only can throw the overhand right and miss. But I'm telling you, after what happened in Sean last fight, that's gonna be on his mind. We've seen fighters. Like he was on six fight win streak though. It don't matter. He accept. I'm saying he accepted it, dude. And I'm saying that's been replaying in his mind for a long time. And now you fight somebody else with knockout power who also take people down to the ground and ground the pound. But you team. also gotta understand though, fighting Alex, he don't get no worse than that too, man. So once you go out there, and you step in there with Alex, and you. Fighting. Alex only had one way to win, and he let him do that. No, I'm saying, and, then, but and, and Jared can also knock him out with left hand, right hand, knee, high kick, elbow. You got somebody who arguably got more ways to beat you by knockout. Take you down to the ground and ground and pound you. Alex literally has one weapon. It's the striking, and it's more specifically left hand. 
Jared can knock you out and he can actually beat you in left hand. You mean head kick, knee? No, but I'm talking about. But his left hook is his bread and butter. Meanwhile, Jared got left hook, right hook, knees, elbows. It's it just more, man. He got. He actually has more diverse striking of Billy. You know why? Because he's not necessarily worried about getting taken down by every opponent. He's not worried about that. He's worried about everything else. He's worried about takedowns. He's worried about striking. But yeah, that's my pick, Sean Strickland, man. Uh, okay, well, we'll see.